Okay, that, okay. that works. All right. Um, well, let's begin then. Um, good morning and welcome everyone. It is wonderful to share this time with you today. Uh, we're gonna start off by um, telling you a little bit about who we are and what to expect. Um, so, Summer, we're gonna go to slide number two. So who we are, um, we are mothers on the front line. At our most fundamental level, we are three friends that share the lived experience of parenting children with mental health disorders. Uh, it was from that friendship that we developed empathy, understanding, and we gave each other support during the most difficult parts of our parenting journeys. And through that, we discovered the commonality of our pain, anger, fear, frustration, bewilderment, and sadness. It was the unrelenting epistemic injustices and social harms, regardless of our different positionalities, at the heart of so many of our damaging experiences. It was not parenting our children or their battles with mental illness. From this, uh, we developed what we've called a sisterhood of survival. Um, and as none of us can abide injustice, and when you combine a philosopher, Tammy, and a social scientist, Dion, and me, a bit of a rabble rouser, and you focus our mother energy and other talents on the problems harming our families, this organization with the express purpose of creating healing and systemic change through transformative epistemic justice work came to be. A little bit about what you can expect from us today. Um, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. We aren't going to follow the typical panel discussion format. Our presentation is gonna flow back and forth with each other as we co-equally share the space and the work. There will be time for questions at the end and there will be an interactive exercise to help you get a feel of what it's like to be a participant in one of our workshops. We also hope to challenge you a bit, little bit maybe make you a little uncomfortable as we make visible the invisible ways that epistemic just injustice shows up in all spaces, sometimes including even feminist spaces. Most of all, we hope when you leave that you will have found something valuable to take with you and perhaps it will find its way into your work or grow in other fruitful ways. Before we begin, um, Take a minute, please, and gather a sheet of paper and pen um, for the exercise that we're gonna do later. It, it should be separate from any notes that you will be taking. Um, as you have questions, or if you have resources that you would like to share, please put them in the chat. And although we won't stop the flow of our presentation to answer questions, we will answer those questions at the end as time allows. Summer, can we go to the next slide? All right, so all of our workshops, we start off with a grounding exercise and a guided meditation. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Um, we understand how the virtual space lends itself easily to distraction, mental and physical exhaustion. And we would like to help relieve a little bit of those difficulties. And I would like to invite you all to join me in this short meditative and mindfulness activity to help focus our attention and ground ourselves in this space. If you aren't already, allow yourself to get comfortable. Shift around in your chair, adjust your clothing, your glasses, take a sip of water. With eyes open, take a deep inhale, filling your lungs completely. Hold that inhale for a count of three. Exhale fully. Now look around and to yourself, identify three things that you can see. After you've identified these things, 
please close your eyes. Take another deep inhale, fully expanding your lungs. Hold that breath for three seconds. As you release your breath, focus on two things that you can feel. Maybe it's the tension in your shoulders, your chair pressing against your legs, the softness of your slippers. Take another deep inhale, fill those lungs and hold that inhale for a count of three. As you exhale, I want you to focus completely on my voice and what I'm about to share with you. Continue to keep your eyes closed and breathe deeply until the conclusion of this exercise. The Sufi poet Hafiz says, how do I listen to others? As if everyone is my teacher speaking to me her cherished last words. Listen now with all of your senses, as if the whole universe might exist to teach you more about love. Listen to the things you don't know, to your fears, doubts, restlessness, and discomfort. Make friends with them. Know that where we stand in all our mistakes and imperfections is holy ground. Listen to your joy, your passion, your creativity. Celebrate and share them. Listen to your body, to your aches and pains, your fatigue and your energy. Honor them, care for them. Listen to the strangers you meet today. Listen to your elders and your children. Notice the more you pay attention, the more connected you feel the more answers reveal themselves amongst the chaos, the more accessible peace is. Now take your deepest breath yet, inhaling fully and holding it for a moment. Now exhale slowly and completely. Gently bring your attention back to this moment Take two more deep breaths. May you know peace today. Now, Summer, we're gonna move on to the next slide, please. Well, again, welcome everybody. And I would like to introduce myself um, my name is Angela Riccio. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. I live on Bainbridge Island, Washington, just across the Puget Sound from Seattle. And I would like to acknowledge that my home sits on the unceded traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, both past and present. It is with honor and gratitude to the land itself and the Duwamish tribe that I make this acknowledgement. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, please, slide four. I, um, I oh. am, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, you forgot yeah. to introduce your picture. So can we go back? Yes, I'm sorry. I just realized. <laughs> I was supposed to do that's okay. all right. Um, I, I have two pictures here for you, um, pictures that have a lot of meaning to me. Um, during our development of this workshop, uh, the theme of invisible women and invisible work kept coming up for me. And I wanted to honor those women. And when I have been that woman um, in multiple ways, um, the first is in the uh, brochure profiles, I left my profile workshop blank. I wanted it to be a visual representation of that invisibility, even in feminist spaces. I wanted the picture to be something disruptive. 
uh, maybe something that drew both curiosity, discomfort, and even judgment. Um, I found it difficult to fill out my profile because I don't have degrees or a CV or um, awards, um, except for my chocolate cake. I do have an award for that. Um, I've not been published and yet here I am. In this work, I do struggle with believing I belong, particularly because I don't fit into any of the social norms of who is and who is not allowed to be a knower. But when I start to doubt myself, I go to my garden um, and the picture with the marigolds and the shadow of me is one of many pictures I have in my garden. Um, it is where I'm most calm and centered. It is where I feel connected to everything and everyone important in my life. It is where all the noise and neg negativity fades away. And the other picture is a picture of my grandmother. And when I need to be reminded of my fierceness, that it's okay to defy convention and that compassion needs to be at the heart of my work, I think of her. And now we can go to the next slide and pass it on. So, uh, hi, um, I, I'm Dion Benson-Smith and um, I reside on unceded peach land um, in the city of Rancho Cucamonga, which is about an hour outside of um, Los Angeles in Southern California. So I always like to give acknowledgement and thanks to um, First Peoples who um, helped to carve out the space that, that I now sit in. Um, I'm a transdisciplinary scholar um, and I work at the intersections of gender and race studies and public policy. And right now I'm teaching um, at Claremont McKenna College and I'm part of the Claremont College Consortium broadly. Um, and in addition to my work um, at Mothers on the Frontline, I'm also part of the reproductive justice movement uh, where I work and I write. And I also chair the nation's only community-based IRB that serves the reproductive justice community. So we are the first of its kind that's really putting forth reproductive justice principles and ethics and, and um, within a research um, setting, um, but that really focuses on the epistemic harms and injustices that have been done to BIPOC communities and BIPOC women um, in particular um, in the research process. Um, so the pictures that I chose um, to, to sort of that kind of spoke to me, um, not only in this moment, but in general are, are representative of I think how I became and, and the person um, that I am today and the person that I think is most um, responsible for that. So the first one is a picture of me when I was about four years old and um, my mother had agreed to allow me to choose my um, hairstyle um, for Easter that year, which is a big thing because hair is a, is, is a major thing in the African American community and Easter, especially going to church. I mean, that's like the pageantry of church on Easter Sunday is, is, is not only a focal point of the African American community, but our family. And I told my mother I wanted to Afro. And um, I, I first of all applaud her because the time that it took to actually get my hair into this afro, which is an incredibly like big afro, um, was was considerable. And I wanted the afro because every woman that I saw that I admired had an afro. Angela Davis, um, my Montessori teacher, Mrs. Montesquieu. So I was like, I want my hair like that. I thought the afro, and I still do I think, is like one of the most magnificent um, hairstyles. And my mother did it, and she got a lot of negative feedback. I got a lot of flack because you know, hair is political and Afro at that time was very political. And um, I remember my mother saying that it's my hair, it's my body, and I have a right to choose how I want to present myself. And so I consider that to be my first like radical feminist moment. And um, underneath that picture is a picture of my mother who has, even though she does not identify as a, she's always shocked when I identify her as a feminist, but she is. And she taught me 
basically everything that I know um, in terms of how to use my voice, where to use my voice, and has always encouraged me to use my voice in the service of my passions and has always supported me in doing so. Um, and then the last picture is what I call um, filling my cup. Because in all of the movement spaces around motherhood, we're always talking about how we need to fill our cups first, how we need to restore ourselves. And so this is a picture of me on literally my 50th birthday, um, restoring my cup and in Northern California amongst the Redwoods. And um, I like this picture because it would not be made possible if my children were not safe if I knew that they were not cared for and knowing that they were safe and that they were cared for made it possible for me to, to go and fill my cup. So, and I'm gonna pass it on to Tammy. So Summer, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by recognizing that I am on um, the ancestral territories of the Kikapu, Iowa, Sauk, Meskwaki, and Oteti Sakawin ancestral territories and um, that were stolen by white settlers and then later um, formally through government land concessions. I'm also 70 miles within the Meskwaki settlement, which uh, the Meskwaki people purchased back and on which they still reside. Um, I had a lot of trouble with this slide, as Angela and Dion know, so I'm going to do my best to get through it, but I decided instead of putting a picture there to put a date. January 2017 is the birth date of mothers on the front line, but for me, beyond that, it was a new beginning. It really was a strategy for survival. My husband, my best friend, the love of my life had died suddenly. And at that moment, I had been managed to keep up with the demands of mothering two young sons, one with severe mental health disabilities, while teaching. And it was largely because of the incredible help of my mother who at this point was now aging and unable to help the way she had before. In this moment, I had to figure out how to weave the remaining threads together to care for my family while not dying of grief. Mothers on the front line allowed me to integrate my various experiences and lenses in a way that was healing and transformative. I brought the experience of mothering a child with Tourette syndrome, autism, and bipolar one. This experience of trying to keep my beloved child alive and out of the carceral system, and with it, the lens of trying to navigate broken systems from stigmatized spaces. I brought the experience of a state and local advocate working with various mental health organizations on legislation and policy. And with it, I brought the lens of a mother at these policy conversations at the table, not being taken seriously, but being seen as just a mom. As a scholar of the history of philosophy, I brought my penchant for philosophical analysis, deconstruction, and genealogy, and I couldn't help but apply this lens to stigma and punitive systems. And as a professor, I found ways to integrate our work at Mothers in the Frontline into my classrooms at Grinnell College, creating courses on mental health policy, the school to prison pipeline, and epistemic injustices, and more importantly, open up my teaching by becoming vulnerable and being in relation with my students in a way I never could have done without the work we do at Mothers in the Frontline. Most of all, I brought the unrelenting, unrelenting pain of a mother watching her child battle suicide attempts, mania, and depression since the tender age of 10. From this incredibly tight space, I turned to the source that us women have always been turning to, sisterhood. In this case, sisterhood with other mothers to build our village and banish isolation. Mothers on the front line really comes out of the sisterhood, a friendship that already existed from long conversations we already had about navigating the world as mothers of children with mental health conditions. But we had decided to share this, these conversations, this vulnerability with the larger community. The next slide, please, Summer. So a little bit about our organization. We started in 2017 with the Just Ask Mom podcast. In this podcast, mothers interview other mothers. Our, one of our um, methodology um, requirements is that the interviewer and the interviewee share salient lived experience. During this interview process, they share their stories of their experiences in a way that allows the storyteller to have complete agency over 
the story, how it is shared, and how it is framed. We as an organization use story work to disrupt stigmatizing narratives and importantly to create narratives from lived experience. And this is different than the advocacy I had been involved in with other organizations previously, which often do use story work, but they have a narrative of their campaign and then they seek stories to fit that narrative. We went about this very differently as a grounded method where we start with the lived experience and take it from there. In doing so, we centered mother stories and voices and our interview spaces importantly didn't prioritize story as product, but rather story work as a healing process. Saying what one needs to say in the moment they need to say it and the healing power of being heard. We conceptualized our organization from the beginning, not as a distributor of knowledge, an educator of parents, providers, or so forth, but rather as a wisdom collective that would gather and share the wisdom of us mothers to then help the world, including providers, other parents, and so forth, understand they're not alone in this journey and to have the perspective and wisdoms of mothers to help them in their work. Since then, our programming has grown to include several other podcast series, facilitating workshops and building curriculums, and public speaking and outreach. And in this slide, you can see some of the work that we were doing in the first slide, where with the SE Justice Group, we presented a panel with them at the Social Justice Prize at Grinnell College, um, talking about the importance of story work and activism. In the second picture, we brought a bunch of students from Grinnell College to Hampshire College for CLIP, the um, um, Civil Liberties and Public Policy Conference. You see Angela at the bottom at our table. We table at many conferences to do outreach for, uh, to caregivers and families. Um, and you also see other um, local activities. We do a lot of work on the school to prison pipeline. And then I'm based in Iowa, so I have access to caucuses and elected officials during presidential campaigns. And so we also do a lot of outreach at the local, state, and federal level on policy with elected officials. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, Deanne, you're on mute. I'm off mute now. Yes. So um, we wanted to also highlight um, who we've learned from and more importantly, the, the work that um, grounds and situates the work that we do both as um, a movement, um, as not only scholars within movement, um, and as a wisdom collective totally um, in, in terms of methodological practice and the content that, that we are producing. So first and foremost, I, I, we are firmly grounded within the reproductive justice movement. We, our work intersects with the reproductive justice movement. Like I said, um, I work within the reproductive justice movement and um, you know, my mentors are actually the founding mothers of, of um, the reproductive justice movement. So it permeates a lot of the work that we do. It permeates the principles through which and with which we work. Most importantly, um, the reproductive justice movement's principles of the right to parent, the right not to parent, and third, the right to parent and nurture children in a safe, healthy, and sustainable environment. And that means economically sustainable, socially and culturally safe and sustainable environments. And then the fourth pillar of the RJ movement, which is the right to bodily autonomy and pleasure. Um, possibly one of the worst things you can do to a woman is threaten to remove their child or actually remove that child um, away from them. It's one of the worst things that a parent can experience and it's probably, it's one of the worst threats um, that parents, particularly parents of children who um, have mental health challenges and BIPOC parents and mothers experience and suffer on a daily basis. Um, in addition, the inability to properly care for your child, to properly access and have access to the proper resources that are sustainable, nurturing, and curative is another cause and another source of trauma for parents and children of, um, with mental health challenges. And this is how we see ourselves really intersecting 
um, the work that we do in this area really intersects with that third principle um, within the RJ movement of the right to parent and nurture children in a safe, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, so our, recognize, our work recognizes and is focused on ameliorating these types of harms, the, the um, epistemic harms that come from both the state and institutions and come from that threat of, of losing children and the um, threat to our autonomy and our right to make decisions on behalf of our own children. Um, the second picture is a picture of if we had a face of like our founding mentor, patron saint of, of our particular organization, it would be uh, Dr. Keisha Scott. Um, she is a renowned scholar um, in sociology, um, also a member of the faculty at Grinnell College and was a mentor of mine as a mentor of all three of ours and, and really has profoundly affected the way in which we understand our work in movement, not just our work in terms of scholarship, but the movement work that we do. And all of her work really is at um, the intersections and highlights the, the importance of movement and activism um, and social movement and activism within community and that feedback loop back into scholarship, not the other way around. And she's done um, an incredible job and spent a, a, a lot of time mentoring us and helping us shape our workshops and shape our message. Um, so we wouldn't be here without her. And then finally, um, Joanne Archibald's work, um, Indigenous story work, you heard Tammy use the term story work. Um, and at the beginning of, of introducing our organization and just the term story work, number one, but the methodology and the praxis of really embedding and, and, and um, centering the stories, experiences of marginalized people, BIPOC people um, in not only the research process, but for us in how then we go to define our movement space and we define the types of advocacy that we um, employ and then how we redefine that. So we always consider this to be this kind of didactic fluid um, loop where our organization will not remain static, but it will also be kind of this way of a curative space and a relational space um, with the communities that we engage in. And, and the method um, that, that Archibald presents in indigenous story work is the foundational method um, that, that we utilize to create the Mothers on the Front Line um, workshops and our methodology. Uh, next slide. Up oh, and I'm paused again. I know I'm having an issue a little bit with my technology, so I apologize. Uh, there, I think I fixed. I hope I fixed it. Fingers crossed. Um, so I just wanted to go very quickly through the children's mental health justice um, principles. That that these are the principles that that really permeate and and guide the work that we do and how we present ourselves, our forward facing um, work as an organization. And our children's mental health justice principles, the first principle is that children's mental illness and mental injury and harms are real and deserving of care. And I always say that and I just say period, because I don't think there needs to be a discussion <laughs> there. Um, and the second principle is that children's mental health justice and caregiver justice are mutually dependent. And what we're saying here is that care is not interchangeable. Care cannot be commodified and parsed out as widgets and, and, and um, you know, um, it can't be, be dissolved into mute one constitutive part, right? Um, treating care as such is both an injustice to the caregiver and the care receiver. Um, we believe that care is a relationship between the caregiver and the care receiver. It's a fluid relationship in which both are giving and both are receiving. And it occurs in and through relationships with one another, relationships with the community. Um, and thus caregiving is an engaged practice. So it's both and, not an either or um, uh, an engagement. Um, third, um, we believe that the lived experience of children 
caregivers and families and communities matter. Um, the lived experiences from where we should be getting our knowledge. It's the lived experiences of all of these groups that should inform the creation of our institutions around children's mental health. It should inform the creation of the policy, and it should also inform how we engage and talk with one another within community. These groups have expertise that are gained through specific lived experiences that needs to be centered and it needs to inform all aspects of, like I said, our systems, our policies, our institutions, and even our cultural engagements with one another. Next slide, please. Now you're muted. <laughs> I just saw that, thank you. So as Deanne was saying, um, the children's mental health justice framework is through relationship. Um, we believe that care happens through relationship. And it's really important to, under, to see for our framework that the whole purpose of our organization, of our framework and so forth is really seeking the well-being and agency of children, their caregivers, their families, their communities, with the focus on children's mental health. And well-being and agency are produced and expressed through care. And as Dion said, care always happens in and through relationships. So care is the center of our framework. Um, children's mental health justice seeks well-being and agency also in opposition rather than different from compliance to power transactional productivity, which are so common in our neoliberal structures today. So therefore, our framework is restorative rather than punitive. It focuses on restoring relationships and meeting needs caused by harms, whether those harms are individual from individual violence or whether they're from structural violence. Our framework is collaborative rather than behavioral. Carrots and sticks do not address causes of problems labeled as behavior because they don't meet the needs and most often perpetuate harms. We're not big fans of sticker charts and such. Um, whether an intervention is aimed at a child, a family, or community, it always has to be done in collaboration with that child, that family, or community to determine what the unmet, unmet, unmet needs are and to um, address any harms that are causing those needs. Our framework is transformative rather than reformist. We focus on transforming conditions so that the harms no longer occur. It's international rather than binary structural rather than individualist, and liberatory rather than supremacist. Next slide, please. That's my slide. Um, what is a wisdom collective? Um, in the corner here, I have a picture of an, uh, some art by Joe Jason that for me really embodies uh, what I think about in a wisdom collective, how all, all of the things that we want to heal um, are interconnected. Um, and so in our wisdom collectives, we all must have shared lived experience. It is again, the concept of things aren't being interchangeable. You can't bring somebody into the space who doesn't have a child with um, mental health disorder because they really, can't understand what we experience. Um, our Wisdom Collective is there to help build community. One of the problems of um, stigma and parenting children with mental health disorders is that it's very isolating. And so we wanna disrupt that isolation and bring people into community. Um, another important part of it is it reframes narratives that are prejudicial and again, stigmatizing. Um, and in our Wisdom Collective, we focus on healing and thriving. And we do a lot of that through reimagining, reimagining what um, care could look like for our children, reimagining what our relationships with family, schools, and other structures um, could be. Because if you can't imagine it, you can't create that. Um, a couple of the other things that are in there, it would be that uh, wisdom collectives are reciprocal and mutually beneficial. 
They are non-hierarchical. We don't believe as the facilitators or leaders of the group that we have more value uh, than our participants and that we can't learn anything from, from those people. Um, and it also has to be trauma-informed and a non-judgmental space. Um, next slide, please. So our, our wisdom collectives, and it's important to, to, to note that the wisdom collective is both a philosophy, it's also a praxis, it's a way in which we are practicing and, and incorporates um, methodologies and, and, and learning both that we both what we get from community and what we bring to to community. And the, the purpose of this is really to address the particular forms of epistemic harms and injustices experienced by parents and caregivers of children with mental illness and mental health challenges. Um, and, and, you know, so epistemic harms or epistemic injustice is this sort of fancy word that, um, you know, honestly comes from the philosopher in our group who has introduced this to the harms to persons in their capacities as knowers. And then in this case, we're really um, talking about the harms that are done to parents and caregivers and particularly women and mothers, right, um, um, in the process of, of seeking care and, and caring for their children with mental health challenges. And so the Wisdom Collective is really the sits healing space, as Angela said, it's a space of, of where those of us who have direct experience can talk from our direct experience with other folks and, and have that centered in um, the space that we're in. Next slide, please. We understand Wisdom Collective uh, as an emergent strategy. Um, and as has been already said, really our focus is on disrupting epistemic injustices and resisting narratives that cause them, healing from them and reimagining new narratives. And so epistemic injustices take many forms um, that these, particularly what happens to mothers, um, mothers are often not believed when they are telling the doctor or school or so forth what's going on with their child. We're simply often not to believe, or in other words, we experience testimonial injustice. We're often not understood or misrepresented. Um, sometimes we have trouble understanding and naming our own experiences because they're not reflected in the general culture. And that's a kind of hermeneutic injustice that we experience. So these epistemic harms not only make it hard for us to get the help that our children need, but it affects our mental well being as well. And one of the focuses of our organization is that caregivers count too, they matter too, their health and well-being matters too, as well as that of siblings and the family unit as a whole. So as Adrian Marie Brown tells us in Emergent Strategy, right, complex systems and patterns, they arise out of simple interactions. And so this is the approach we take. With the strategic emphasis on building critical connections and authentic relationships, as, she, as Marie Brown tells us, and as she says, quote, listening with all the senses of the body and mind, end of quote. So that this can really transform existing systems and patterns into something new. And that's really the emergent strategy that we take is small conversations among caregivers, bringing those conversations out into the larger world with elected officials, with other organizations and so on. We at Mothers of the Frontline see the violence that our current punitive systems do to children, their families, their caregivers, and so forth, whether we're talking about educational systems, healthcare systems, policing and incarceration systems. They not only stigmatize and criminalize mental illness, but through punitive paradigms and practices often cause significant mental injuries and harms themselves. We seek to be part of dismantling these punitive paradigms and transforming systems to center care. So the Wisdom Collective then really is an emergent strategy to contribute to this change making that we're doing together with so many other movements, so many other organizations and so on. So we center healing in everything that we do, resisting research methodologies and advocacy methodologies that are extractive or transactional with people's stories and insist on trauma informed story work methodologies and practices that emphasize the agency of the storyteller. The foundation of all of our work is that wisdom that's gained and shared through these interactions. So we 
build out like seeds cast to the wind, right? Through this emergent strategy in several different ways. Seeding movements, we all sit in other movement spaces and try to disrupt those spaces when we see caregivers not being mentioned, when we see children's mental health not being mentioned. We make sure to bring those to those spaces, whether their space is working on racial justice, reproductive justice, general mental health advocacy and so on, we're making sure to bring it to those spaces, abolitionist spaces and so on. We also advocate for systems change at the local, state and national level. We've particularly been involved in school to prison pipeline issues and dismantling that pipeline and also in care infrastructure, uh, legislative advocacy and so on. We are focusing on changing narratives through public and academic speaking and writing and envisioning new frameworks and structures by providing opportunities for caregivers to come together, safe spaces and reimagine, as Angela had said, and then sharing these reimagination with decision makers. So in our uh, workshops, we have learned that it's really important to do grounding exercises because having these discussions can be very triggering of trauma. This, is partic this particular activity we're about to do is nice, and Deanna and I both use it in our teaching as well, so you might like it for that reason as well, because it builds a grounding exercise into an exercise that also primes people for group discussion. So we're going to go ahead, I'll turn it over to Dion and do a group activity that resembles part of what we do in our Wisdom Collective workshops. Next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the spiral journal exercise. And, and just to heads up, um, Summer, is it possible for you to, to keep, do you also have um, uh, uh, hosting duties? Because for some reason, my um, hosting buttons are not present. So when it comes time, and we may not do like to, to do a breakout room, because there's three of y'all and I would like to like put you in a breakout room. If somebody else, do you have hosting duties also, Tammy, that you can do breakout rooms? Okay, you're muted, but yes. Yeah, right. I'm doing the breakout rooms and I'll make sure we can do okay. that. Okay, that's yeah. perfect. That's perfect. That's all I just, I just wanted to make sure about that because I just looked down and I couldn't see all of, all of my uh, buttons all of a sudden. So, so um, we're going to do a, a spiral journal activity, um, and and I don't know if you're familiar with it, if you've done it before, um, but if you go through the spiral journal activity and it's something that that you want to incorporate or you want to to utilize in your teaching or in even in your research, um, we've included the link on the slide, and I think we can actually probably include it in in the chat or. Um, so this is a unique to us as an organization, um, but we have learned this exercise. I've utilized it um, in my classes and, and I also teach a methods class. And um, it's something that uh, some of my doctoral students have started to utilize in their own research practice. And the purpose of this, like Tammy said, is to, to, to ground us and to kind of get us refocused um, within ourselves and within this moment. So remember we asked you to, get a sheet of paper. So we're gonna take the uh, sheet of paper, eight by 11 um, sheet of paper, and I would like you all to fold your sheet of paper in half, like sus. Don't worry if you're like me, my halves are never equal. My son has OCD and this would drive him crazy. So I'm fixing it just because it's my habit to fix it now. Um, then take your sheet of paper and fold it in half one more time so that you have four roughly equal quadrants. Give everyone a second to do that, so. So you should have, your paper should be divided into sort of four equal quadrants. So I wanna invite everyone to take their writing instrument and place this at the center of your paper. And when I say begin, to start drawing tightly, a tight spiral as slowly and as tightly 
as you possibly can. And there is an example on the next slide. If you yes. go to that, if you if you have questions. So there you go. And begin. Okay, and that's two minutes and it feels like a long time. Um, and it's meant to kind of get you in that kind of swirl. So, all right, so wherever you stop, usually I invite people to start wherever you stopped um, drawing your circle or any quadrant, pick one quadrant. And then the first quadrant, can you click the next slide, please, um, Summer? Answer this question. As a mother, a time when I was not believed or heard was. And just write whatever you feel or whatever you're thinking. Okay, so in the next quadrant, Summer, can you go to the next slide? The next quadrant, the prompt is, my invisible labor includes, my invisible labor includes.
Okay. Can we have the next slide? The next prompt in the next quadrant. My experiences as a mother matters because. My experiences as a mother matters because. Okay, and finally, the last quadrant. I am strongest when. I am strongest when. All right, I'm going to stop. I don't know what happened. Um, I got booted out, but I'm back. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to pause actually the recording anyway. I think the recording probably stopped during this exercise, which is wholly appropriate um, during a spiral exercise, not to have it recording. So if we can go to the next slide, because now we're going to do the second half of, of, of this activity. Okay, 